morning and welcome to Concord Baptist Church on this lovely day. In February, we were going to eat next week, but then I was kindly reminded that it's Valentine's Day, so all of you uh, guys will have to take your women somewhere, I guess. All right, most of you... Most of you know by now about the accident Friday night and uh, Friday night and uh, Cindy, Derek's mom, Cindy was all right. She had a fractured wrist. Derek's mom said that uh, Derek had a yeah, abdominal bleeding. He had surgery yesterday, came through it all right. Uh, his brother was in critical condition. Who had the 14 broken ribs? Yeah, Dylan. Dylan. Dylan? Mm. And, uh, huh? And uh, Kim, the little girl that was here the Wednesday before, she, uh, what, her face got messed up, bleeding on the brain. Somebody said the side of it. bleeding on the brain, and then they had a really depression. Now she got a short term memory, but I didn't hear anything about her face getting messed up. Cindy said, uh, Saturday morning said something about her face, but she was moved from Lexington to Richland, mm -hmm. and uh, she was in critical condition. But uh, I, I, it's hard to <clears throat> it's hard for me to understand her sometimes because she's you know you know how Derek squeaks and uh, <laughs> with my phone, but uh, something about a drunk driver was behind him or something. No, a drunk driver was coming around a curb and hit him on the passenger side. She was saying something else, yeah, different from what. Behind her or something, yeah. Yeah, and and, uh, and hit him on the passenger side. It was, I guess, it was messing with him. It was a drunk driver. He didn't get a scratch. Of course. Of course. Yeah, away. yeah. So keep them children in prayer. I tell you what. You don't realize it, but when these young people start coming and all, and you get attached to them, I'll tell you what, I cried like a baby. Amen. It just ate me up. I didn't sleep all night Friday, constantly worrying. Huh? I didn't sleep all night Friday, constantly worrying about them. But, uh, you know, people letting their children out late at night in this day and age, you know, it's like Brother Tommy said, anything after 11 o'clock is not good. Because you got the drunks coming out, you got all that. They need to be home. Exactly. Amen. And, uh, huh? Everybody wants to be entertained. That's what I grew up when I was with uh, Dylan with like Tyler and all that stuff. That just, I said, like you used to say, that wasn't what it was about when I was a kid. I told my dad one time that I was bored and he gave me enough stuff to keep me busy for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> a lesson from what you like. Yeah, my, my mom and dad, yes, I, no matter what, grew up, we were with them at all times. I mean, anything they did, I was there. My sister was there. Never ever. We were entertained always. And yeah, look how he turned out. <laughs> 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 Amen. But uh, I'm I'm glad they're out of the red zone and pray for their healing and spiritual healing too. Because you realize that if any one of them died without Christ, where they'd be today? Them children, them young people. And you know what? God let them hear the gospel. Amen. Amen. So be sure to keep them in prayer. Morning. Biscuit must have been a little tough this morning. Took you longer to chew it. Uh, <laughs> Brother Dave, if you would pray for us in those prayer requests. Amen. My Lord, God, my Savior, Lord, again, we do thank you for this day. We do thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love, Lord. And Father, Lord, you heard the prayer request there for all the young people that got in the wreck on Friday, Lord God. And Father, we do pray, Lord God, that you look after them, Lord God, that you, you help them, Lord, that you get them healed up, Lord. And, get them back home. Uh, some of them are still in the hospital and all, Lord. And 
Father, they can get them all back healed up and get them back in church, Lord God. And Father, we do pray for all the, the sick ones and ones with afflictions and all here in our church, Lord. And Father, I do uh, glad to see uh, Sister Linda feeling better and back in church here for the second uh, service in a row, Lord. And that's a blessing, Lord. And, uh, and Brother Steve also, he's come in. He's he's uh, healed up enough where he can, he can get around a little bit now, Lord. And that's a blessing. So, Lord, you're answering prayer on that behalf, Lord. And Father, I pray you to keep answering our prayers, Lord. And keep encouraging us, Lord. And, and uh, Father, just uh, look after each and every one of us. Guide us and keep a hedge about us, Lord. And Father, we're here to hear from you today in the Sunday school class and the preaching hour, Lord. I, I do pray that uh, you have your, your your preachers and all that, that they're that they're studied up, prayed up, Lord, that they're ready to, to present what you'd have us to have today, Lord God, and help us, encourage us, uh, strengthen us, Lord, here in these uh, in these uh, wild and, and unsure days. And we thank you and praise you, Lord Jesus Christ, name we do pray, amen. Amen. You know, those young folks, they stick it out here and they're saved. They're the future to the church, amen. And you know one thing about Derek? He took these papers. He don't have no problem passing them out. He took stacks of tracks, passed them out. Huh? Took them to school. Took them to school, yeah. <laughs> he, he was passing all that stuff out. Amen. And uh, you, you listen to his phone message. He says, have a blessed day. You know, I I think that uh, Lord save him. He'd be a fireball. Amen. He ain't got enough sense not to be. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right. Okay, you usually call my name. Evangelist Tim Wheat, would you please come lead us Thank in the music? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Or in the morning, I should say. <coughs> ho, ho, ho. Very funny. <coughs> All right. Good morning, Concord Baptist Church. If you please stand, turn to page 236. Don't make me do it. Cracker. <coughs> hmm. I have to, I can feel it.
Yeah. 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 Next, it's uh, well, I have, good morning. My name is Dale Simpson, and welcome to Concord Independent Baptist Church.com. And for those on Facebook, it's Frank Townsend, T O W N S E N D. And uh, just would like to say a hearty welcome to everybody that can make it out this morning. It's a little chilly out there, a little damp, but it's always good to see everybody make it in the house of the Lord. And we are truly blessed to be here all. Together this morning, safe and sound, um, missing a couple people as we were expounding upon earlier, um, just goes to show how fleeting life can be and how you must put your trust in the Lord and the sooner the better because you never know when that curve you go around is going to have a vehicle coming straight at you. So... Uh, and we would just want to keep. Uh, what's what's their last name? Preach. Brand Brandon, isn't it? Bradford. Bradford. The Bradfords. Uh, and in our Kim, prayers. I don't know Kim's last name. Neither do I. <laughs> and we would. Uh, I I like to also ask everyone to keep my cousins in your prayers. Uh, the Biddle family who lost there in uh, two weeks ago today. My first cousin. And I did not get the message till the night before they were going to have the funeral and they rushed that up because of a impending snowstorm up in West Virginia. And they didn't call me specifically because they were all in quarantine for this Kung flu mess. And, uh, it was, uh, a tough one to swallow. I've been texting him for weeks because we conversed a good bit. In fact, I was closer to him than I was just about any of my kin people. And, um, uh, he didn't text me back and come to find out he had he'd been in the hospital to, since around the first of the year. And, uh, but we won't go into all that. Uh, let's just keep uh, uh, my cousin Jane in, in your prayers and all the family. This, uh, as I was saying earlier, this thing with, with your salvation and making sure that you have got your ticket punched. I mean, it, it, for lack of better terms, it's it's imperative that that every time you pull out of a driveway could be your last time, and it it is something that all of us need to take out a look at ourselves and make sure we're ready to go. Should should it be your time? Uh, we're going to this morning. I am. I wanted to touch base on something that we discussed last week on page 52, which is, uh, had James Ireland, Lewis and Joseph Craig, and Aaron Bledsoe. And when I tried to do some research on them, I wound up with genealogy and uh, Facebook stuff on people, and they're not sure if I'm hitting the right people. Uh, I kind of backed off of that a little bit and decided to go in another direction, uh, which was the something that we, we talked about a little in the past, but we never really covered it, was the conflict between the Catholics and the Protestants and what is today Ireland. It was something that confounded me early, earlier, uh, some 35, 40 years ago when I had my own soccer team together and I had a I had a gentleman named Tony Henley who was from England, and he was Catholic. Unspeknowing at the time in a conversation that came up, and he gave me a little insight that I want to share with everybody this morning. Let's first uh, open up with a quick word of prayer here. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for another beautiful Sunday morning, Lord. The sun's trying to peek through out there. It's a little bit chilly, but uh, every day is a blessed day. Lord, we we ask that for forgiveness for anything that may be unsightly, anything that is not pleasing with you, Lord. We just ask that you please forgive us. And, and Lord, we give thanks and blessings for everything that we take for granted, all the little simple things in life that just we don't give thanks for. Uh, just the, the information we got this morning on uh, 
Derek and his family uh, just goes to show that that you're, you need to be in touch with the Lord. And if you have not accepted him, then please ex- accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Lord, give me the, uh, I'd like to also, we've already covered my prayer list this morning, Lord, but uh, once again, just show mercy and, and solace and compassion where you see fit. And Lord, give me the verbal clarity to convey a message this morning, which would be meaningful and insightful. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, like I said, I started out with, with James Ireland. This is page 52. And I kept coming up with Ireland and the conflict between the Catholics and the Protestants. Uh, does, uh, I don't know, preach, do you have any? I mean, do you understand what? I, I do now, a lot more than I did. I, did, I actually have for quite some years now. Uh, this friend of mine named Tony Henley that played on the Granby football team, a football club, actually, was something I had back in the 80s. And uh, was the Lord blessed me with some really good talent, and we had some very successful teams. And Tony was one of those guys that came in. He had a work permit to, to work here, and then every six months or a year or something, he had to go back to England for a while, and then he could come back. And uh, for a couple of years there, he was an active participant. Uh, he was not a sterling athlete. He was not unlike me, which could run like a greyhound when I was young, and run long distance. But Tony was had what we call a sweet foot, meaning he had a tremendous skill. This kind of stuff, if you know anything about soccer, only comes if you start playing as soon as you start walking. And it is the ability to control the ball and have it do things that people here in the United States don't understand because it's... It becomes part of your part of your culture. And instead of going home in the summertime and there's baseball on TV, in the fall there'd be football, or in the winter it'd be basketball, the only thing on over there was either cricket, rugby, or soccer. And Tony grew up in that atmosphere. But sometimes after practice, we would go out to eat or we would go to somebody's house and we'd be flipping hamburgers or doing chili or whatever. and and Tony and I got into a little bit of a discussion about, about the conflict. There had something that happened over there. And I said, I just do not understand how Catholics and Protestants can't get along. Well, <laughs> as, we, as you can see here from reading In the Trail of Blood by J.M. Carroll, we kind of get a little bit of a better sense of what was going on here. And if you get into Fox's Book of Martyrs, you really understand how there could be some problems. Well, the problems in Ireland, and this guy was Catholic now, so he didn't, he caught me off guard because I've been raised a Baptist all of my life. And he caught me off guard with his, with his talk of Catholicism. And I had never really been around a Catholic at all. Been around a lot of Lutherans, which is close. Close, kind of like Catholicism without a pope. That's right. And um, but Tony and he said, "Well, I was raised in a household where my not so much my mom, but my grandma would talk about her brother that was killed by the Protestants, and his daddy who was killed by the Protestants, and and then." Another distant relative from 100 years ago would have been burned up in a house fire that was started by Protestants. So he had this antagonism toward, toward Protestants. Now let's, let's look into Protestants here. You got to remember, when they say Protestants, never one time in anything I read preparing for this little short message this morning, that I hear the word Baptist. Or did I see the word Baptist? Everything was Protestant. And these Protestants were the Anglican Church and the Presbyterians that are the primary adversaries of the Catholics in Ireland. Even today, there is still, 
uh, a calm uneasiness as as both sides still look at each other with contempt. But this all started back in the, I guess it would be the 16th century, the 1500s, where uh, uh, Henry VIII kind of decided he wasn't going to pay homage to the Pope and decided he wasn't going to send any money to, to Rome. So he basically came up with the Anglican church. And of course, and then it went back as soon as Bloody Mary got back in there, it was back to the Catholic, was the church state religion of England. And then it went as soon as Catherine got in, there, it was back to the Anglican church and back and forth it went. Then all of a sudden they got a heavy influence from of, of the Presbyterian church from the Scot Scottish areas around 1600. So it has been a constantly changing. It's kind of like our presidency where we had Trump and then now we got Bump. Got that other fellow. Bump on alone. Bump, yeah. And uh, and he's trying to undo everything the other guy did. And here we go again. But this this animosity between these different factions in Ireland actually stems from not only religious uh, problems, it also stems from land. And all through this period of time where England was having trouble controlling Ireland, they would actually send their, I guess you would say pioneers, their uh, people to go in and inhabit the area. Like if there was a lot of open land, they'd cut it up. And then now all of a sudden you've got a whole bunch of Anglican church people moved into an area which has traditionally been Catholic and they don't like each other. They, they had all kind of wars and fighting amongst themselves. And uh, there's been all kind of proclamations where the Catholics couldn't hold office under this administration. Uh, then when they, when let's say it was William the third came in, he got rid of everything that James the second had put on the books and uh, they cut off all of the Catholics from any kind of office holding. They couldn't uh, trade in some cases, uh, couldn't provide for their family. They would take their lands. At one time, they even had a land swap before, between a couple different counties. It would be like here today here in Lexington County, where originally it was settled or predominantly it was Lutheran, all the Lutherans got together and said, all right, to all you Baptists, y'all got to move over to Richland County and we'll take all of their Lutherans and bring them over here. I can't imagine having to move out of my house and move over to somewhere strange on the other side of town or the side of the county, another county, just because if I continued to live where I was, the government could not, or the law enforcement could not ensure my safety. Uh, this was very prevalent over there. They had wars and battles. In 1690, there was the Battle of Boyle, is the way I'm going to pronounce it. It's B-O-Y-N-E. Uh, it was uh, between William III and James II. Uh, James II being Catholic and William III being Protestant and they William III won and pushed out all of the product I mean all of the Catholics and every year to this day on July the 12th they have the parades and I'm sure the, us older guys probably remember the younger folks don't have a inclination of what we're talking about but they have a great big parade over there it's kind of like Mardi Gras. They dress up in all kind of weird costumes, and I'm not gonna say weird. I mean, it's weird. Yeah, <laughs> they they dress up in costumes and they parade. These are Protestants now through the Catholic sections of town, and basically poke fun at them. And it's been times when this has turned out to be violent. Uh, I kind of wonder why they do that. They call it the Orange Order. Uh, then to this day, on July the 12th, they still 
go into the other side of town and I guess you would say try to make a problem, try to incite a riot, uh, poke fun at them, whatever there is. Uh, uh, it's it's kind of like looking for trouble, but I guess they've got their reasons over there. But but Tony, I, I sensed when I was talking to him, and, and he was telling me how his family, and he had been taught this by his by his grandmothers and aunts and the elder people in his family from a very young age that the Protestants were not their friends and they resulted in the death of a lot of the people in their family. This is the same kind of thing that goes on today in Croatia, in Serbia, and what they call Bosnia now, which was, I don't know where they got that name Bosnia from, but even back in the late 90s when NATO went in and tried to restore peace to this area, which where they were having what they call ethnic cleansing, uh, which it was, it was ethnic cleansing. Uh, NATO stuck their foot into this thing and we were actually bombing what we call the Christians in Croatia. Uh, they were Eastern Orthodox Christians, uh, kind of like Eastern Catholicism, once again, without a Pope. I think they got a bishop or something that's in charge over there. But once again, it's, it just goes to show how long. And that conflict started in the 1300s, like 1350. And they, they're both sides fighting back and forth all through a time when the, the, the Turkish invasions of 14 and 1500s. So you've got this groups of Muslims that are still there. And incidentally, the ones in Bosnia have wiped out 1,400 churches in the past 22 years, 23 years, since that war incurred. So them being charging the Croatians and the Serbs with ethnic cleansing, they're just as guilty because they have done the same thing and moving all the Christian churches out of what is now Bosnia. The underlying cause that I understand from the deep state side of it is the reason we were in there is they wanted to run a pipeline from the Caucasus through what is now Bosnia to get to Europe to let the oil flow. So once again, it'd be under oil wars. Now this wasn't the problem in, in Ireland, but it was because of land mostly. Who controlled the land and what kind of restrictions were put on the people, what kind of freedoms that they would lose because of their religion. Does that sound familiar? <clears throat> if, it, if it doesn't, you need to keep up with current events, what's going on <clears throat> around the world today, especially here in the United States. It was a horrible, I mean, just battle after battle. And the, the one in 1690, the Battle of Boyle was another one. And then they had one about four or five years later, another terrible uh, massacre. There was two that were committed by Oliver Cromwell, who we spoke of earlier, where he went in and captured some garrisons that were controlled <laughs> by the Catholics. And for lack of better terms, he massacred them. The, the, whoever surrendered was put to the sword. And... Uh, these are the long held, I guess you would say, memories of the Catholics in this area. And they're guilty of this kind of stuff too, that, that stoked the fires even today of people who are still religious. Now, we don't hear about it as much as we used to because of one very important element that has affected us and just about everybody in religion is what we call, or what I call the deep state, wants to do away with all religion, period. And uh, the persecution that we could see in the following years could be evidence of that. Uh, let's hope that it doesn't trickle down to this area to us, but it could very easily. Uh, I was going to this morning bring my 
little pocket constitution and we would go into some of that which is needs to be gone into because uh, so many of us have never even read the constitution and it's it's something that uh, I think we will learn to hold close to our hearts uh, as we read it to find out the way it should be and the way it is um, but I just wanted to cover this this conflict over there because it did interest me and I was taken aback by Tony when he was telling me this story and I could tell it really affected him to tell me about Protestants and at the time I would have thought the Baptists were included in this but I would imagine that the Baptists were in Ireland at the time or whatever Baptists were there because I'm sure there were some they had to keep a pretty low profile and I don't think they would run around poking anybody with a stick, uh, they probably were probably keeping their head down and um, on their knees praying a lot. But the conflict between these people, it only goes to show that, that religious animosities between these different factions can manifest itself into violence very easily. And, uh, you would hope that these folks would, would start living by the scripture instead of by the sword and not the scripture, scripture as interpreted by the Catholics or even the Anglican Church or even the Presbyterian Church, but that of the New Testament as was written by the disciples and you would hope that they would find salvation in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and somehow live by the tenets that we should all live by. And preach that is going to be it for me this morning. And uh, I'm going to let you take over here because I didn't bring my pocket constitution with me. I left it sitting on the desk this morning. But uh, I hope that would give you a little more insight on what that terrible conflict was in uh, Ireland that's still going on today. Uh, there's been a lull in the action over the past 30 or 40 years, but I could I feel that it could manifest itself again at the drop of a hat. It's just going to take a matter of somebody doing something stupid over there. They, uh, the Irish Republican Army has pretty much uh, been quelled. And in, in this day and age where they can look over your shoulder real easy, and big brothers everywhere you turn, it actually I would think make it harder to do things like that. But uh, you never know. And, and that's it for me this morning. In everything you do, preach Jesus. And if you have to, use words. Thank you. Amen. Brother Tom, you got anything? <coughs> Oh, amen. I reckon I'm coming up here. Glory to God. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dale. You know, I was just thinking about children, you know, that when the accident and the mother and all, and I've been praying for them like the pastor really hard. And, you know, the Lord, <clears throat> he didn't save us to go out and change people's lives. You know, a lot of people, we just want to change everybody's lives. What he did, I wrote this down. It said, the Lord doesn't teach us to change people's lives. It teaches us to live a, God, a godly life. Amen. He wants us to live a godly life. He wants us to be a light in this dark world. Amen. And we should be a follower of Jesus. You want to see people's lives change? Get yours right first. Amen. That's, that, that's what it boils down to. Get yourself, uh, uh, according to God's word, get yourself right. And so I was reading earlier Matthew chapter four, uh, <clears throat> Matthew chapter five. And then I said, you know, to live a godly life and be a testimony to the Lord, be an ensample to the people outside. That's what we're supposed to be. That's what we're called to be. But so many times we get wrapped up in everything else. We're trying to change people's lives and we can't even get our our lives right have you ever really That's sit right. down and thought about that 
and sit there and prayed, meditated on that. Until you get yourself right, nobody else can be. I'm just, that's just the way it is. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you straight up truth. The past three or four weeks, uh, I sit back and uh, I started studying and reading real hard and started listening to other people, you know, and I said, what are you doing? You know, I'm supposed to be a light to this world. You're supposed to be, if you're saved, be a light. These children we see, they go, they going through, they had operation, you know, they in the hospital, critical condition, and that might may be just an eye opener to the parents. Yeah, yeah. How about that? <clears throat> but you know what? Everybody forgets, and I, I I heard this this morning. What about the guy that hit the people? Right. He needs prayer. He ain't never going to forget it. How about that? If one of them little children die, he's not going to forget about that. Maybe he needs Christ. Maybe he needs somebody to be praying for him. See, we, we look at the people that's all down and all. We don't think about the other side. Where we should be. And how we should be acting. How we should be praying. How we should be wanting to live a godly life. Not selfish. That's what's wrong with most people. We're just selfish. Amen. We worried about us. But in Matthew chapter 5, I'm, I'm just going to read for a few minutes. And let's start in verse 1. It says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, I want y'all to listen to these words. I know that this is written to the Jews and all, but listen to this. Uh, um, it says, blessed are the meek, or they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. How many people really have to go through that? Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth. Are you any kind of salt? I mean, these are things I'm looking at and, and looking at myself. What we're supposed to be as Christians. And like I said, I was thinking about the guy, the other guy. I really was. And somebody brought it up this morning when we were sitting there talking, and I thought about him. Just like the, the the lady that hit Pastor Randall, you know he's they got problems. They don't have Jesus. That's what the problem is. And we're supposed to be a light in this world. We're supposed to be a living, a walking testimony of what Jesus Christ has done for me. How He made me a new creature in Christ. He did all this for you and for me. So we will receive him and have a changed life and have a heavenly home. Because this life here is short. We see these children, look at this, they're 14, 15, 16, 17 years old. And they could have been dead. God spared their life again. Mm, man, just think about it. He spared their life. And there was a purpose. There's a reason. You can't point. There's my wife. She went through her son, turned 18 years old, got killed by a drug addict. Hit him. She went through that too. But you don't point fingers at God. Look at yourself. Examine yourself, your life, where you're at. Sometimes God takes people out for a reason. There's a purpose for everything he does. Maybe it's an eye opener for you. That's right. So you will see how short, how how much we need the Lord Jesus Christ. So many times we we just don't even we really don't 
think about it. We don't really believe it. Because if we did, we'd have a changed life. We'd be living for Christ. We'd be that light in this world that we're supposed to be. Uh, verse number 12 says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. How many people are excited and rejoicing and really understand they have a heavenly home to go to after here? But other people may not because they hadn't seen Christ in us. Maybe we'll be the ones to push them away. Say hello to Derek. Hello, Derek. <laughs> hey, amen. Oh, it, but... It says, again, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost his savor, where, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thence, thenceforth good for nothing. Is that you? Have you lost your savor? Have you lost that salt, that saltiness that we're supposed to be? Because you caught up in your own little world and your little thing, the little thing you built for yourself, not living for Christ. Have you really thought about it? Have you really meditated on you, where you're at with Christ? Time is short. We're not guaranteed the next breath. Amen. But we can be guaranteed a heavenly home if we believe and we receive Jesus Christ. Truly repentance. True repentance. Most of us just play in a game to wake up and just go through the motions. Because we can we can, you know, look good to everybody else. That's right. At home. We don't think about God. We live the way we want to live. In front of everybody, we want to impress them. I'm such a godly man. You know, the Lord shows you that. He's supposed to. He's supposed to put you at the level where you'll be wanting to serve him. And you'll care about other people. Well, y'all have to give my hairdo here. It's, it looks pretty rough there. <laughs> I had to throw it out, man. Oh, my goodness. It says... <laughs> And in verse 14 says, ye are the light of the world. Ye are the light of the world. And that's what we're supposed to be in Christ Jesus. We're supposed to be a walking testimony. We're supposed to be rejoicing in what we have. How many of us are happy about anything that we have? Don't look like anybody's too happy. <laughs> Seriously, though, I mean, I, this morning I just want to come up and, you know, exam, tell you, examine yourselves according to God's word. Are you being a light where you're supposed to be? Being that new creature in Christ Jesus? That's something wonderful to me. That's something to rejoice about. Because yeah. this life is just temporary. But we do have an a, a, a eternal home somewhere. It's either going to be in heaven or hell, Pastor. That's it. There's no in between. Amen. That's so I'll just ask you this morning look at yourself, examine yourselves, see if you are the light or trying to be a light. Be some kind of light. Be a testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Man, my mouth is dry. <clears throat> You know, Tim made the comment yesterday that I jinxed those kids by all the things I say. Hey, Amen. Good Good of course, I know he don't believe in jinxes and superstition. But, uh, you know, you think about how God is trying to warn people. David said there is but a step between me and death. Amen. Amen. Uh, the Bible says, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeared for a little time and vanisheth away. Yeah, right. Amen. He said, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring. Right. Amen. Yeah. It says, if we say we're going to go here and go there, he said, if the Lord will, we'll go here or go there. Yeah. That's why I said, 
anytime teenagers out after 11 o'clock at night, they're playing with fire because that's where the drunks are. They've been in the drug addicts. I never let my son stay out like that, and he's 20 then. They've been. You know why? I worried about him because I know what's out there. I pray every day that the Lord put a hedge about my wife and my daughter and their vehicles. Amen. That they bring us home safely. And the Lord has been faithful to that. I can tell you. My wife can attest to that also. Amen. But you think about even when the young people were here on Thursday nights, we were saying, hey, you never know. You could pull out here and get hit. You could meet somebody coming at you. You know, you don't know. You think about today with the people on the cell phone. You go down the road, and i tell you what, you go down Nazareth, and I guarantee you'll meet at least one, if not more, that's coming over like that. Amen. You have to be alert. You have to be on top of it. But do you realize here we are running 55, 60 mile an hour on a two-lane road with a little line between us? All it takes is that. Amen. So what is your life? It's a vapor. <laughs> I mean, we could be gone like that. Down there, at, uh, I forget the name of the church. It's the one where uh, the guy that had the Red Roof Church. I keep forgetting. It. Johnny. Johnny um, Slice. Slice, yeah. And he took over that other church down there towards Wagner, that white church on the hill. Uh, that friend of mine, uh, John Way, he was buried there. What was he doing? He had come by the church here. We weren't open. He went on down the road, down Nazareth here, went to help somebody on the side of the road, was laying down, trying to hook a cable to pull the guy out. And the old woman come down there and went off the road and killed him. Amen. After just coming back from Kuwait. I mean, who uh, who knew that would happen? Our days are numbered, and we don't know when they're up. Thank God the children are healing. And uh, Derek on this morning listening to us. Amen. Man, if he knew how many tears I shed for him yesterday, him and that squeaky voice of his. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I was telling them, Derek, how you've been passing out the old paths and the tracks and working real hard. So hurry up and get well. I don't like you, though. <laughs> we love you. All right. I want to say something about this one verse, then we'll take a break. That Tommy brought up. He says in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 5, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, where shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. And the Bible says in another place, salt is good. Amen? Salt is good. And I said, wait a minute. If the salt's good, how's it lose its savor? And uh, I got to thinking about it, and the Lord showed me. The way they process table salt today, they take out all the nutrients and everything, all the good. And I remembered that you'd wear a dark uniform like we wear, and you'd sweat, and you threw it in the laundry, you'd see white streaks through there from the salt. Your eyes would burn Amen. When, drip, when your sweat dripped down. Or if you tasted the sweat when it come down off your face, it'd be salty. And then I noticed we didn't have that anymore. The salt's lost its savor. That's why we try to get the Himalayan uh, regular sea salt, unrefined salt, amen, because it still has everything in it. You know what? I started tasting salt again. My eyes started burning again. Amen. You can't beat this old book, can you? It's right on. All right. Brother Steve, dismiss us a prayer. We'll take a break.
Amen. Be back in 10.